There's a bit of a fascinating article today from Business Insider around Marvel's efforts to improve diversity. And specifically, the the little headline says that Marvel insiders say that they're skeptical of its recent pledge to improve diversity in its comics and company after employing only two black editorial staffers in the last five years. Now, there's a lot in this article, and and undoubtedly you're going to see a bunch of videos on it. The article does probably the best job, I think, uh, that I've seen so far of kind of touching on the the actual, you know, quote-unquote problem here. But it still falls short in a couple areas, so let's get into that. Hey everybody, this is Perch. I want to lead with kind of my view of of diversity in companies, just just to level set you where I'm coming from. You may have a different point of view, and that's fine. Um, but from my standpoint, as somebody who's worked uh, in you know in comics and in tech and has has built products, diversity is a powerful asset to building a product. But when I say diversity, I'm I'm talking about true diversity. I'm talking about diversity of race, of gender, of experience, of wealth, of of well, I said the word there, experience. Experience is the real key. Um, you can take people of different races and have them live in different parts of the world. I mean, they do today and get wildly different experiences. The experience of a black man living in New York City is vastly different from the experience of a black man living in Brazil or in South Africa. There's, there's very different things they bring to the table. And so when you go out and you say, we want to create a diverse workforce, what you're trying to get are a number of different perspectives, which round out your product, which makes it more accessible to more people and to provide more context. But in a lot of cases, companies use diversity to to narrow in on their products. They go for one surface trait of somebody, and then they make a product for that one surface trait. And that's the opposite of what you're trying to do, what you should be doing. The goal is to make your product uh, loved by many. And and to do that, you often need to get a lot of different perspectives on that product. Chris Claremont has given interviews in the past. Chris Claremont, you know, older white guy, has given interviews in the past where he talked about purposefully going out and seeking out different forms of literature, different articles, different uh, things from different people, from different experiences to help round out his work. He would ask other people to kind of weigh in or or look at some of his ideas who had different backgrounds. Now, Chris Claremont, I didn't say he wasn't assembling some kind of panel of like United Nations level people. He he knew that he could go and get different points of view that that was valuable to him. And that's what diversity is is meant to accomplish. However, in many companies, and and you see it definitely at Marvel, diversity is used for, for a very different purpose. They find a, a, you know, a, a diverse writer, somebody who's different from the other writers, a person of color. They then say that person of color needs to write this person of color character with no buildup, no backup, no marketing support, nothing around it. And that comic largely fails. It doesn't hit its audience, which everyone could see coming because this character, uh, it, it had no lead up. It had no background and it was appealing to a segment of the audience, not the broad part of the audience. That's, that's the goofy part. Marvel continuously, and this is a problem in comics, uh, you know, the article talks about how Axel Alonso really pushed to bring in diverse voices and good for him for doing that. But they then put those diverse voices on characters that looked exactly like the voice, thus kind of nullifying the entire point of diversity. But this article is interesting because it goes into how uh, in the early 2010s, Marvel's comic business focused on diverse slate of new characters. So right off the bat, almost this article is uh, it, it 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 can't help itself but get into the characters and the stories as opposed to the the workforce, and that's kind of the mistake. When you're Marvel, you have a number of huge properties that are known around the world that they're doing giant movies off of and everything else. You can't magically just wave a wand and have uh, some new diverse characters join that level of sales and attention. It doesn't work that way. These characters took decades to get where they are. So what you're going to have to do is slowly build some new characters up and you're going to have to give the core characters big, bold, exciting, different experiences, different stories that people are going to get behind. That's that's the trick. And it, it's not that hard, but people do a lot of mental gymnastics to avoid the obvious. 
The, the article does point out that in 2010s, Axel Lonzo ushered in this new uh, era and sales fell in 2017, which they did. Now, the article actually goes into one of the traps that uh, got um, David Gabriel and a bunch of other people in some hot water uh, a, a while back saying, what well, was diversity that caused those comic sales to fall? Not really. The quality of the stories had dropped. The price had gone up. The crossovers were just abysmal. And it, that's why it failed. It, it, you know, the, the diverse voices were largely going on to comics that were, you know, dying immediately. You know, they, they, they launched Mosaic and it, it goes nowhere fast. The Inhuman stuff went nowhere fast. All these new titles were dying out within three or four issues. They're not responsible for the decline in Marvel in 2017 because they, they never added anything to begin with. What's responsible in 2017 was the, like I said, the crossovers, the stories were just going nowhere. They gave readers an amazing jumping off point with Secret Wars. And it and, and the diversity efforts that they were doing seemed really, really shallow. And as we read this article, we find out they absolutely were. You know, <laughs> you talk about, uh, you know, the, the editorial department. There are no black staffers on Marvel's editorial team, about 18 people and only two people of color. So here's the interesting thing. And, and again, this article kind of briefly touches on it in little places. For all the talk, for all the panels, for all the finger wagging that Marvel would do about how they were committed to diversity, the reality was their editorial staff and the people working on the books were anything but diverse. And, and don't fall in the trap. Again, diverse means more than just race. It means uh, certainty sexuality, but it also means, you know, people of different religious backgrounds, people of different economic backgrounds, people from different parts of the country. That was also part of the problem. Marvel continues today to hire based on networks, to based off of uh, friendships. And you see these pockets of people all come out of the same place who worked in the same comic shop or who worked on the same uh, comic news website. And they all have the same views. And, and that's not diversity. That will not work. The article goes on. There's a couple of places you know, that people will, um, will point out. Uh, for example, um, you know, Chris Beecham, who's quoted in the article, is, uh, or Char not Chris, Charles Beecham. Ah, sorry, I should go back and edit these things. But, you know, I, I like having my mistakes just out there. It's, it makes me human or, or just somebody that makes a lot of mistakes. Anyway, Charles Beecham, uh, living in New York City, with a child, his salary at Marvel was $38,000. He said that after three years as assistant editor from 2014 to 2017, without a promotion or a raise, he was ready to leave. So I just, so let me stop there for a moment. You're Marvel, you're owned by Disney. You're one of the biggest recognizable brands in the world. You have a staff job as an assistant editor. These are the people who are curating the books. And I've talked about this in the past, but I don't know that it's always resonated with people. $38,000 a year is not a livable wage in New York City. Just full, full stop. I, I want to encourage, if any of you really want to kind of look at this and, and, and you know, <laughs> understand it, um, I defy you to go online to a glass store or some of those places. Go to Seattle, look up tech, and look at entry-level design jobs. Entry-level at places like Microsoft or Google or Amazon or Cisco or um, even insurance companies up here, anything else. I've got a good friend, just graduated uh, from college. Uh, they landed $92,000 a year base right out of college. Um, in addition to the 92,000, full benefits, five weeks paid vacation a year, and about $150,000 worth of stock right out of school. Um, she, it, it's insane that she's making that salary, but it's, 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 it's insane that somebody working for Marvel on some of the biggest characters and Charles Beecham was $38,000 insane. So, you know, it goes into a little bit about how the staffers come in and how, uh, Disney and Marvel's grown to a cultural force that extends beyond his comics and movies and, and, and so on. And it talks about how uh, Axel Alonso ushered in this new era of really wanting to have new and diverse characters. They talk about uh, changing uh, Thor to uh, Jane Foster and a lot of these moves. And, um, you know, basically this bold new diverse era, and they, they summarize it all in one paragraph. Jane Foster was a new Thor. Sam Wilson 
was a black character replacing Steve Rogers, Captain America. Riri Williams uh, was introduced as Iron Man. Kamala Khan was a new Ms. Marvel. And there were multiple others. The, the, the challenge are, and, and he says this wasn't exactly a new phenomenon in comic books. Characters are regularly passing on their mantles at least for a while. That's true, except it did all happen all at once. And there is the flaw. We, we spend a lot of time about diversity and, and people will do videos about woke culture and all the rest, but, but this is a marketing problem more than anything. You have an established set of characters that go 50, 60 years. You have an editorial staff that's dramatically underpaid and they are all aware. I mean, as Charles was aware, they're aware that while the company is talking about diversity and bold new initiatives and all the rest, they aren't hiring those people. Those people are still coming from the same, you know, good old boy or good old girl networks. They're still coming from friends. They're still coming very much in a tight little bubble. There's not opportunities for jobs. There's opportunities to write and work on some of those characters with no benefits or long time security for practically nothing. There's, there's that. And meanwhile, the characters all get replaced simultaneously within the space of 12 months. Now, if you're a Tom Brevoort or a uh, Joe Casada or, you know, even Axel Alonso, he's getting a lot of praise in his article. Um, you should get a lot of criticism for that move because you're guaranteed to fail as a product blunder. If you wanted to introduce some of these new characters, you needed to do it one at a time. You need to do it carefully. You needed to do a decent build. Jane Foster was probably the character that worked out best in terms of sales. A lot of people talk about how the sales tanked when Jane Foster came on, on Thor. You can look at the data with Comicron. That is, that is absolutely untrue. That title held up better than most of them. Um, it did because there was a, there was a, it felt like there was a plan felt like Jason Aaron, whether people liked the book or not, it felt like there was a plan of several of these, the Riri Williams by contrast felt like it just, it came out of nowhere. There was no plan. It was written terribly. If you put the two side by side, even the most hardened kind of anti-diversity person would have to admit that the Jane Foster version was handled with a lot more care than the Riri Williams version. And, Again, these diversity items can work. And, and like I said at the beginning, diversity can be a very powerful tool for companies, but they have to commit to diversity as a whole, not diversity as a kind of a shallow veneer that goes on to comics. These This, this approach that they did guaranteed poor sales. It guaranteed a bitterness. It guaranteed a divide between fans and the creators. And on top of that, Marvel as an entity was creating its own internal divide by paying very little, by paying very very little, and by you know basically leading with we're we're super diverse and we're super uh, you know behind these things, and then not putting their money where their mouth is. The article talks about how Alonzo stepped down to his role and replaced by C.B. Sobolski, a white man. Well, I mean you know he, he does have that Asian heritage. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, anyway, the um, it it. it, it it, 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 unfortunately, Charles Beecham, who has a point, then goes in to give some quotes about the comics that Alonzo made me think I could work in comics. But when the Latinx guy is scapegoated for diversity and replaced by a white dude and the sentiment was that Marvel was getting away from its roots, what does that mean? I think you know what it means, uh, Charles. You know. Um, those comics, it was bad planning. Now, to, to your point, I don't think C.B. Sobolski came in and did any better of a job in terms of the planning. But Alec Axelonzo did a very poor job of bringing these characters in. It's great that uh, the comics he made uh, made you think you can work in comics. That's nice. But he also did it in such a way that it was guaranteed to fail and, and not sell, which nice for you, but bad for all the other people, all the other kids out there who, who might want to get into comics someday. It was guaranteed to be a short-term, poorly run initiative, which it was. I don't know why uh, people kind of always forget about that fact that, hey, when, when push comes to shove, these comics were poorly planned, poorly marketed, poorly rolled out, done kind of all at once, in many cases felt like a cash grab, not like a true push for diversity. And Marvel was getting away from its roots. When you have a, a company, you know, what does that even mean, getting away from its roots? It means that you have a company for 60 years publishes comics with some of these core characters. And then, like in the case of, of Ironheart, Ruby Williams, within two issues, you'd kind of, you know, done a, a very hacky storyline. 
um, you 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 piled it into this absolutely abysmal Civil War II book, which by the way was you know two white characters fighting each other, just you know for for, for reference. Um, so this is not a this is not a pushback on diversity. I think almost everybody who read Civil War II would have far rather had like Carol and Tony replaced by like anyone else. I mean anyone. But it, getting away from its roots meant you you spent all this equity building up these characters, and then you shoved new ones in with no fanfare, no care, no no balance, and then you kind of went, "What? Why are you complaining? I don't get it." And of course, sales does rule. The numbers were poor, but I would argue the numbers are not poor because of the you know Miles was black or because uh, Sam Wilson had Captain America. They, it was not poor for that reason. It was poor because the stories were bad, because the planning was bad. That's that's pretty much it. But the real thing that people should be upset about, because again, this article makes the same trap that a lot of others do. It goes right back to the comics, but they did touch on on the problem. Thirty-eight, you know, thirty-eight thousand dollars is not a livable wage. Saying you're a big into diversity um, and then hiring nobody is a problem. You can't just make the characters a certain. Rate. You actually have to have a workforce that looks diverse. And we got to stop talking about in terms of white dude, black dude, or white guy, uh, Latino woman. We have to start talking in, in terms of this person comes from California, this person comes from Kansas, this person comes from Mexico, this person comes from Norway. We got to start talking. If you want to talk divor- diversity, we've got to actually get diverse opinions, not just go with skin color and then the end. There's more to it than that. There are a lot of, of people who can do work. So, uh, but the, but the article does keep going down. You know, here's this quote by uh, Yumi Odin, the founder of East Coast Black Age of Comics Convention, which says, "There's not a lot of there's not a lack of people who can do the work." He's right about that. Now, why anyone you know reading above, knowing that you're going to make thirty eight thousand, I don't know why you'd want to do the work, but you know, I'll leave that there. It says it's about how receptive the industry is to them. I can think of twenty creators, mostly African Americans, who'd be ready to work at Marvel. Cool, but how about how about we go broader than that? You know, it's, it's, you know, they, they, they have an unnamed woman here who says uh, she was never promoted, given a raise from her $30,000 salary at her three years in the company. And this is a, a female assistant editor. You know, the notable exception, they says Sana Aminat, Pakistani American, former editor. She's now Marvel's head of content and character development. Good for her. But is it though? Why does the staff look the way it looks? Why are they paid what they're paid? I guarantee you, Tom Brevoort, Sana Aminat, Joe Casada, they're not paid $30,000 a year. Those salaries are far higher. So maybe rather than writing these articles, kind of contemplating, was it wrong to replace Axel Alonzo with white guy C.B. Sobolski, sort of, um, maybe some of the focus should be on why are the, why is there such a massive salary discrepancy? Why does uh, Marvel in particular uh, say they want diversity and push this stuff out in the comics with very little planning or promotion or thought behind it, but then have an internal staff that doesn't reflect that whatsoever? Why do several of their editors and their writers and their creators all come from the exact same location, either you know places in Boston or Portland or California or New York? Why, why do we basically have four zones? And then wherever Donnie Cates lives. Why, 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 why do uh, so many, <laughs> why is, 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 or do so many of the creators and editors and people at Marvel have the exact same network of friends? That's not diverse. I, I you know, it, Disney is committing to, to, you know, quote, unquote, making it better. And I hope they do. But I, I admit, I have a very deep suspicion that their attempts to make it better will not make it better. Because if the goal, and there's a quote in here somewhere that Disney's going to commit to hiring more people of color, cool, but from where? And what's the plan when they get there? And are you still paying them $30,000? Are we going to talk about that? So the challenge is, it's, it's, it's an interesting article. I, I have a link in the description. You should go check it out. It's it's so close. It touches on a lot of the right elements and it brings some of the right facts out, but it doesn't take that next step to to really question, you know, hey, maybe there's some some deeper problems here. 
check it out for yourself. Anyway, what do you think of all this? Uh, leave a comment below. I, I, again, I, you know, diversity has gotten a really bad rap from a lot of people, a lot of channels. They, they rail against diversity, but diversity is a good thing. The challenge is what we're seeing here is not diversity. Having a bunch of surface characters just kind of shove out into the world, that's, that's not diversity. That's, you know, pandering. Having an editorial staff that all comes from the exact same location, regardless of the skin color, which also is the same, but forgetting about that for a moment, they all have the same background, came from the same place, have the same people, and are paid dramatically lower than their superiors. I, yeah, that's the problem. And that's why we're stuck in this loop. And I don't have any confidence it's going to get better. Anyway, leave your com leave your comments below. Would love to know your thoughts on it. Like, subscribe, uh, follow me on social media on Twitter or Facebook, or send me a mail at comicsperch at gmail.com. It's interesting because I get arguments, uh, and I, you know, I'm I'm blocked by various creators who run the block bots and everything else. It's weird because I suspect <laughs> if they would just listen, <laughs> I'm on their side in a lot of cases. I would like you to be paid more. I would like you to have insurance. I would like for the conditions that you work in to be good. I'd like for the comics that you write to actually have meaning. Uh, meaning some of you are writing really good work that's going nowhere. <laughs> that is not promoted. That's not, that just disappears into the vapor. Um, I would like that situation to get better for you. I'm not your enemy, but it is what it is. Hey, thanks for listening.